So this is the Unit 4 AP Macroeconomics Exam Review. We are going to be covering fiscal policy entirely in this review. The basics of fiscal policy aren't bad. They go with the Keynesian School of Economics that looks at the government trying to fight a recession with expansionary fiscal policy and inflation with contractionary fiscal policy. So expansionary fiscal policy uses two tools that we're pretty familiar with because we hear about them on the news all the time, government spending and taxes. And the goal of these tools is to change the C and the G of GDP. So if we're fighting a recession, the government will decrease taxes so consumers have more disposable income to spend or increase spending. And this increased spending could go towards the G of GDP or they could be trying to stimulate consumers to spend more money and increase the C of GDP. An important note of this is when the government spends more but collects less in taxes, it's going to create a government budget deficit. So always remember, expansionary fiscal policy creates a government budget deficit because that'll come into play when we discuss crowding out later in the video. Contractionary fiscal policy is when the government's trying to fight inflation and they try and shrink the C and G of GDP by increasing taxes or decreasing spending, giving consumers less money to spend, which does the opposite to the government's budget and creates a government budget surplus. Because if the government is collecting more in tax revenue but spending less, they're going to have money left over. Again, keep that in mind for when we cover crowding in later in this video. There are two types of fiscal policy that the government can do, automatic stabilizers and discretionary fiscal policy. Automatic stabilizers are continuously going on in our economy without the government having to pass a single new law. They are set up since the time of the New Deal to kick in during a recession and inflation automatically. So for example, in a recession, unemployment goes up, which means more people qualify for unemployment compensation. If more people qualify for unemployment compensation, automatically government spending increased. No new law was passed, automatically the spending just increased. Or an example of an automatic stabilizer for contractionary fiscal policy is our progressive tax system, where the more money you make, the higher percentage you pay in taxes. So if there's inflation, we demand higher wages. Naturally, by demanding higher wages, we pay more in taxes, which contractionary fiscal policy, increasing taxes, is one of the tools. So it automatically does contractionary fiscal policy without a single new law being passed. Most government handouts, aka entitlement programs and transfer payments, are automatic stabilizers. They are programs that are set up to naturally kick in in a recession or inflation. The other type of government fiscal policy program is discretionary fiscal policy. This, I like to think of something new, something different, a change. So if the government produces a new stimulus program to grow GDP, that would be discretionary. Or if the government changes the current tax code, that would be discretionary. So these are the two ways the government can do these tools. Next, we're going to look at how effective fiscal policy is, and that really is determined by how much of our disposable income are we consuming. The more we consume, the more effective fiscal policy is at changing GDP. And this is illustrated by the spending and tax multipliers. The idea of this is when the government changes spending by a specific amount or changes taxes by a specific amount, they are trying to change GDP by more than that amount that they are spending or changing taxes in. And the best way to show this is by doing a specific example, which I have on the board right here. And we notice on the formulas and on the example, they have the abbreviations of MPC and MPS. These stand for our marginal propensity to consume and our marginal propensity to save which means of each additional dollar of our income, how much of that dollar do we consume, MPC? Of each additional dollar of income, how much of that income do we save, MPS? And we use that idea to determine how much GDP will change by when fiscal policy changes. So let's look at the example on the board. So if spending and taxes both increase by 20 million and the MPC is 0.75, I can use that to show how much government spending will change GDP, how much taxes will change GDP, and the overall effect on GDP with the three multipliers. So the spending multiplier is specifically for government spending, how much government spending will change GDP, and the formula for it is 1 over NPS. 
which I notice I don't have NPS given to me in the problem. And a lot of times College Board does this. They do this on purpose because they want you to automatically make the connection whatever NPC is, if NPC and NPS have to add up to equal that one additional dollar of income, I can solve for NPS. So if NPC is 0.75, that means I'm consuming 75 cents of each additional dollar. NPS has to equal 0.25, saving 25 cents of each additional dollar. So the spending multiplier would be 1 over 0.25, which would equal 4. And there is times the spending multiplier by the change in government spending. So since government spending is increasing by $20 million, I would times it by a positive 20. And I would say that GDP will increase by $80 million because of the change in government spending. Now let's do the same idea but with the tax multiplier. So the tax multiplier is negative because it's illustrating how much of the money taken out of your taxes changes with GDP. So here, if NPC is 0.75, then the formula for the tax multiplier will be negative NPC 0.75 over NPS 0.25, which equals negative 3. Again, I just times that by the change in taxes. So taxes are increasing by 20, so I times it by positive 20, which would mean GDP would go down by 60 million because of the increase in taxes. So when we do the math on this problem, we notice that although taxes and spending are changing by the same amount, 20 million, GDP does not change by the same amount. The spending multiplier number ends up being a larger change than the tax multiplier. And this leads to a very significant concept with these multipliers. The change in government spending will always be larger on GDP than the change in taxes because the spending multiplier goes directly towards changing GDP versus when we're talking about our money taken out of our income and taxes, the government doesn't use all of that money for fiscal policy. They also use that money to pay off the debt, for imports, for savings, things that are leakages out of GDP. So because the tax multiplier has leakages that don't count in GDP, the tax multiplier will by definition always be smaller than the spending multiplier. Which illustrates this idea of the balanced budget multiplier, where you combine the two together. So if I wanted to look at my overall change in GDP, spending and taxes are changing by the same amount. So in this scenario, the government has a balanced budget. They are collecting the same amount in taxes that they are spending. But the GDP change isn't zero. It's a positive number to illustrate again the spending multiplier is larger than the tax multiplier. So in this problem, overall, GDP increases by $20 million when we combine the two. So GDP goes up even though the government's running a balanced budget. So again, keep in mind the spending multiplier is always larger than the tax multiplier. The next thing I want to talk about is a criticism of fiscal policy. So one of the biggest criticisms of fiscal policy is that not all of the components of GDP are helped by fiscal policy, and specifically expansionary fiscal policy. And the criticism of expansionary fiscal policy is crowding out of gross private investment. We are fighting a recession, and to do this, the government spends more but collects less in taxes, which as I said before, always leads to a government budget deficit. That deficit is the key word for crowding out. Because of the government budget deficit, the government has to find ways to fund this. And they're going to use the loanable funds market graph to illustrate how they're finding ways to fund the deficit. So on the loanable funds market graph, we have demand for loanable funds, which is moved by changes in level of borrowing. And in this case, we're going to talk about government borrowing. Do they need to borrow a lot more or borrow less? And supply of loanable funds is changed by levels of savings. And so when we're talking about the government, does the government have more money to save or less money to save? On the supply of loanable funds, you may also see this as private savings or foreign savings beyond just the government, but with crowding out, we're specifically looking at the government savings because of the budget deficit that's created. So if we have a deficit, the government has two options to fund it. They can either borrow more, which is what I've illustrated here, because that would increase the demand for loanable funds. You may also see this as the government will save less, 
pull from their savings to fund the deficit, which would decrease the supply of loanable funds driving it to the left. You can do it either way. Look for the keyword of borrowing for demand or savings for supply to tell you which line to move. Because either way, real interest rates are driven up. And why that's a problem if real interest rates are driven up and we're thinking of GDP, interest rates affect investment, gross private investment, the I of GDP. So if interest rates are higher, gross private investment will end up falling. And that's a problem because we're trying to grow GDP out of a recession. Why is the I of GDP going down when the whole point is to grow GDP? So there are two reasons why we still use expansionary fiscal policy even though this problem ends up occurring. The first is if the government increases the C and the G of GDP by a lot, because again, C is the largest component of GDP, then the decrease in the I by a little, GDP still ends up going up over time. The second reason is if the Federal Reserve uses expansionary monetary policy at the same time, which increases the money supply and drives down nominal interest rates, then the two interest rates will end up canceling each other out and crowding out won't be as big of a problem. So the government needs the Fed to do expansionary monetary policy at the same time for crowding out not to be an issue. Classical economists really use this one as a criticism of the government though, because yes, if the C and G go up by more than the I goes down, GDP goes up in the short run, but keep in mind, gross private investment is a key thing for long run economic growth. So classical economists say by doing this, the government is hurting long run economic growth, but Keynesians care more about the short run and say the long run will fix itself. The opposite of this, is crowding in. So now it's a criticism of contractionary fiscal policy, or when the government's trying to fight inflation by raising taxes and decreasing spending, the budget surplus that is created segues into the loanable funds market graph. So now, because the government has a budget surplus, they have two options they can do with that extra money. They now don't have to borrow as much, so demand for loanable funds will fall, which is what I have illustrated here, or the government now has more money to save. So you may also see this as the supply of loanable funds increases if it talks about savings. But either way, real interest rates are driven down, which now ends up increasing gross private investment, the I of GDP, which is a problem because this is inflationary. We don't want growth in the I of GDP when we're trying to shrink the economy back down from inflation. Same two reasons the government still does it. If the C and the G go down by a lot and the I goes up by a little, overall GDP still goes down in the short run. And if the Federal Reserve uses contractionary monetary policy, which decreases the money supply and drives interest rates out, the two can end up canceling each other out and canceling out the crowding in effect. The thing I want to talk about is the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve is very, very similar to the aggregate model. It just takes out two of the most important topics discussed in the aggregate model. In the aggregate model, we have price level on the Y, which inflation and price level go hand in hand together, which is the Y on the Phillips curve. On the X, in the aggregate model, we have GDP, but we know whatever happens to GDP, unemployment does the opposite, and now we've taken that unemployment and put it on the X axis. And then we have the long run and short run Phillips curve. The short run Phillips curve is going to be used to describe aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply changes, and the long run Phillips curve is used for two reasons. Just like in the aggregate model, we use the long run aggregate supply line to show a recession or inflation in an economy. We are going to use the long run Phillips curve to show the same thing. So on the long run Phillips curve, if I wanted to start an economy in a recession, I would have a point down along the line to the right of the long run Phillips curve closer to unemployment. So this is how I would start my economy in a recession. Or if I wanted to use the Phillips curve to start in inflation, I would have a point up along the line to the left of the long run Phillips curve closer to the inflation. And so I can show, just like on the aggregate model, a recession in inflation. We use the long run Phillips curve for one other thing, because unlike the long run aggregate supply line, we actually have something that does shift the long run Phillips curve. It's a classical idea that says when there's changes in unemployment compensation, it affects the natural rate of unemployment. 
So typically the natural rate of unemployment, that unemployment when there's no cyclical, when you're at full employment is around four to six percent. So we'll say four. So this classical idea says that if the government increases the amount of unemployment compensation, people on unemployment will have less incentive to get out there and find a job. So that on our next peak of the business cycle, we will have a larger percent of people still on unemployment. So that natural rate of unemployment will increase from like 4% to 6%, which would change the long run Phillips curve by shifting it to the right. So the only thing that moves a long run Phillips curve is changes in unemployment compensation, and they have a direct relationship. An increase in unemployment compensation increases the long run Phillips curve. Or the opposite would be true as well. If the government were to decrease the amount of unemployment compensation, two things would happen. Either people would get off unemployment and find a job, and then they would no longer count as unemployed, or they would stop qualifying for unemployment and become discouraged workers. But discouraged workers also do not count in the labor force. So either way, the long run equilibrium, the natural rate of unemployment will fall, shifting the Phillips curve to the left. So the other thing we do with the Phillips curve is show how changes in aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply affect the Phillips curve. Originally, just aggregate demand affected the Phillips curve because we didn't know about short run aggregate supply shifts until stagflation occurred in the 1970s. So the aggregate demand shifts are what's known as the traditional Phillips curve because of that. So originally, when aggregate demand increased, we assumed there was always an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, and this illustrates this. Because when aggregate demand increases, price levels go up, meaning inflation goes up, GDP goes up, which means unemployment goes down. So I can show this inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment by moving up along the short run Phillips curve. So aggregate demand moves along the short run Phillips curve, which this also shows all expansionary fiscal and monetary policy which the same can be said for an aggregate demand decrease. If aggregate demand decreases, moves to the left, then price levels now go down, meaning inflation goes down. GDP goes down, which means unemployment goes up. So it's still showing that inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, but it's going to be showing it by moving down along the short run Phillips curve. So this is how I would illustrate all contractionary fiscal and monetary policy by moving along the short run Phillips curve. So this was the Phillips curve until the late 70s when we had stagflation. And they had to modify the Phillips curve to include now short run aggregate supply shifts. So when stagflation occurred, the business cycle was disproved because now all of a sudden we had inflation and unemployment at the same time, which is illustrated by a decrease in the short run aggregate supply. So when OPEC cut off our oil, our resource costs increased, which decreased short run aggregate supply, which drove price levels up, meaning there was inflation, which drove GDP down and unemployment up. So now all of a sudden we had high inflation and unemployment at the same time, which they then dubbed it stagflation. So how I would show this on the Phillips curve is by actually shifting the entire short run Phillips curve to the right, which is a little counterintuitive. Every other graph in economics, an increase in a graph was a good thing. But on this graph, if the graph shifts to the right, that shows the worst thing an economy can have, stagflation, where the misery index is very high. And also a little counterintuitive a decrease in short run aggregate supply led to an increase in the short run Phillips curve. So the rule is a shift in the short run aggregate supply shifts the entire short run Phillips curve in the opposite direction. The same is true with a positive supply shock. So if short run aggregate supply were to increase, move to the right, price levels would be driven down, GDP would be driven up, and unemployment would be driven down. So now I want to show a decrease in both inflation and unemployment on the Phillips curve, which I would do by shifting the entire curve to the left. So again, a shift in the short run aggregate supply shifts the entire short run Phillips curve in the opposite direction. So a decrease on the short run Phillips curve is actually a good thing. It shows 
what could lead to long-run economic growth. And that is the end of the Fiscal Policy Macroeconomics Review.